Okay. So the, the topic of today's class is, uh, is parallel computing, right? So everyone has heard about parallel computing. Yeah, this is pretty common these days, no? Okay, so let's talk a bit about this. Uh, I have a tutorial here, and uh, uh, but then uh, before we go into, yeah, let me move like this on here, yeah. So the idea is that if you have a, yeah, maybe mix just because I have some, yeah, I wrote a text here. I don't know, when I, when I write these tutorials here, I'm kind of tempted to kind of explain the tutorial pretty much some of the things that I am going to talk in a way. I don't know if that's, that was even necessary, <laughs> but then, then it's also useful for, I don't know, maybe I forget some things, yeah? Yeah, so uh, the idea is, okay, uh, you have uh, some model equations you want to analyze, or you have some, uh, yeah, some computational tests in your hands, right? So uh, I think most of what we have seen here is simulating models, simulating the model equations, looking at solutions, looking at solutions in terms of, of different initial conditions, different parameters, and so on, right? So you have uh, those bifurcation diagrams, you have those heat map plots, right? So those other plots, and so on, right? So this is the kind of stuff that we, we have been doing. And you see that in the last, in the very last class, we already uh, had a problem that took uh, quite a bit of time, right? So uh, at least for the, our standards of just hitting enter and finishing, right? So <laughs> it took like, I don't know, uh, half a minute, yeah, to run. Something like that, yeah, some, yeah, that is not, like, it, it's, you have to wait a bit, it's not instantaneous, but you have to wait, to wait a bit. This is not yet a very problematic thing, right? So if you just wait some 40 seconds and it's done, it's not, not terrible, right? Yeah? But then, suppose that you want to do that uh, with a lot, well, with a much finer grid in a system that has more equations or you have to wait for a longer time so that, uh, it takes a lot longer to compute each point, and so on, and you want to do this for more parameters. Uh, it, it's easy to see that at some point, you might hit a, a problem where you have uh, to, to wait for hours, right? Yeah, is that feasible, yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, so uh, yeah, I, I have done this a lot, right? right? So I have uh, analyzed large systems. We, we'll talk about what I mean by large system later. But, uh, and, uh, and it's not so uncommon that if you want to explore modern really in depth, you have to sometimes run simulations for hours, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes even for days, right? right? Silas knows a, a bit about this, right? It's running simulations for, for days, right? And asking about this. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and then uh, it's important then to, to talk a little bit about efficiency, right? About computational efficiency, okay? Now, the first thing to note is that uh, Python is not built for efficiency, right? It's not built for efficiency. If you really want efficiency from the core efficiency and so on, you have to go to low level languages and programming for training, C and so on, right? And, uh, but then if, that, if that's the case, right, uh, 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 in terms of raw efficiency of your, of your resulting program, why, why am I talking about Python here, yeah? Yeah, that, that's enough a waste of time because if I re have a really hard problem, I'll have to go and learn C and Fortran and so on. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. So no, right, so uh, the point is that when you think in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, efficiency, right? You have to have, a, uh, there, there are two, two things, right? So uh, first there's a, the time that the code takes to run, but then it, 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 there's also the time that it takes for you to, to build the code, right? <laughs> yeah, so it doesn't matter if you can reduce the computation time from two days to one day. If to do that, you took a month to program the code, right? So <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, usually the, uh, the, the goal of Python is not to, be extremely efficient, but it's, it's, the goal is to be very readable and very easy to, to use, right? So that you can reuse code more easily and, you can, uh, and it's also kind of easy to interface. And this is something I'll talk in a moment, is to interface with other languages as well, 
right? So, uh, so when you have uh, an issue like that, right, you have essentially, uh, at least in the onthets that we are looking at, we have is essentially uh, three, three options, right? Three options. The first thing that, that you can do, right, is to uh, optimize your old, okay? So optimize your old is like, well, doing things in a slightly smarter way, right? So if you can avoid for loops and use vectors, Right, so uh, you see, we, we have talked about, about a lot about NumPy arrays, right? NumPy, why operations on NumPy arrays are faster, right? Because instead of the four loops in Python, they're slow, right? So if you have an array, it loads the whole array in memory at once and, and, tries to, and performs all the operations more quickly, right? So uh, I, I, I really don't want to go into details about how processors and memory uh, uh, and, and memory of the processor works and so on, right? Because this is very, very tricky and very specialized in knowledge. But in general, uh, uh, vectorized operations are faster than for loops, okay? And then there are, uh, there are also, th this is I think the main one, okay? But then there are other tricks, right? So uh, uh, don't keep creating a lot of variables of a lot of very large variables, right? So if you have a, a very large matrix, Okay, uh, this state is in spacing memory. Okay, uh, like I don't know, a, a thousand by one thousand matrix. Okay, uh, if you have an object like that, you don't want to keep creating new objects one thousand by one thousand because this process of creating large arrays takes a lot of time. Okay, if you want, if you need to have that matrix, it's better to try to reuse it as, as much as possible. Okay. Uh, because reusing it doesn't have to allocate again, doesn't take so much time, okay? Another, these are just tips, okay? This is not, not an omplete list, okay? Then there's, uh, uh, of course, avoid repeating relations, of course, and uh, this is a little bit tricky also, that is trying to denest your codes, right? So instead of, it's usually better, even if you want to, even if you have to do, what is nested code, this would like, if is inside if is inside if is okay. If you have to do a series of if else's, it's better to do it like for if for a leaf is then an if inside an if inside another if, you know? So uh, it's usually faster to denest your code to have less blocks inside blocks inside blocks than uh, than to have just a single a single level, you know? Okay, so these are some general tips, okay? Uh, these, these things here, usually you, you do more or less uh, naturally if you, are, you have some experience, right? But also it, uh, it doesn't, uh, like if your problem is really uh, uh, long, it usually doesn't solve, just doing that is not enough to like make your, make your OG 10 times faster, right? It's just uh, small tips, right? So the second, the second way to, to, to go around limitations in computing time, right, is using faster programming languages. This is uh, what I talked about. So uh, you can take your code and you can rewrite it in C or Fortran, right? But this is not very useful in practice because it usually takes much longer to convert your code than to just wait for the program to run, right? So <laughs> and then you, when, when the program runs, you can go do some, something else, right? Yeah. Right, so it's the computer time, not chart time, right? So <laughs> yeah, computer time, you can do something else, right? So it's usually not really useful to rewrite your full program in another language, right? But then uh, here there's something that is interesting, that it, but it, that, that is very nice, uh, but I won't teach you here because it's going to be, uh, it's enough messy, right? But then uh, a nice trick here is Sometimes what you can do, instead of having to rewrite your whole problem in C or Fortran and so on, is that you can take just the, fun the, the, the core function of your code and, uh, and, and write just that function in C or Fortran. And that speeds up your code immensely, okay? So what I'm talking about, so for instance, uh, let's say that you have a, a system of differential equations, okay? And then you're going to use OGE int, okay? We talked about OG int. OG int is not written in Python. Yeah, you think that's funny? Because well, the function is there, it's Python, okay? But OG int is just an interface to a library that is a library that was written in the 1980s, actually, that is called El Soda. Uh, there is an American also written in Fortran, okay? 
and, uh, and what ODINT does is just wrap around this library, okay? So it just calls this library, but the code itself is not written in Python, it's written in Fortran, that's why it's so fast, okay? Yeah, so you usually have this end of stuff, yeah. Uh, Mike, yeah, Mike, please. Uh, where is the mic? Yeah. I was just wondering if in this, these cases in which um, one, one uh, function is written in another language, if you need to have this other language installed in your computer. Yeah, that's, that's why I'm not, <laughs> that's why, exactly why I'm not teaching it here, right? Because in order to do that uh, with your code, right, you have to have the tools, the toolkit in your own computer in order to uh, compile a C function or compile a Fortran function, you have to have the libraries of the, that connect Fortran with Python that is called the F2Py. So you have to have this installed in your computer. Right? Even so ODINT? ODINT, OD -int, uh, when you install SciPy, right, it already includes the libraries, the, the, the Fortran library. It, it is packaged together, okay? So that's why when you install SciPy, you are essentially installing that library also. Uh, you don't need uh, the, you the don't compiler need for Fortran, Fortran. You don't need anything like that in your computer. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so this is uh, so this is a bit tricky, okay? Because then you have to to learn a little bit of C, perhaps, uh, or a little bit of Fortran, to just write that function, right? So just write, for instance, uh, the example I was saying is okay. I call OG int or the int with a function, okay? And that function, uh, the function that defines your system of equations, will be called many, many times, many, many times inside the OD int function, okay? Because at each step, it will call that function several times, okay? So if you take, uh, I don't know, thousands of steps, it will call that function many, many thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of times, okay? Yeah, so that function will be run many, many times, right? So if you just speed up that function, then your whole code, even if it's written in Python, your whole code will be much, much faster, okay? So this is uh, the modern approach to optimization, right? Instead of having to rewrite all this stuff, right? You just take the core function, the, or the function that is going to be run many times, and you write just that function in C or Fortran or whatever, okay? Uh, uh, these days, talking about modern stuff, right? these days, modern stuff, uh, there are libraries in Python that help you uh, to wrap this old uh, array from inside Python. Okay? So you just write a snippet of code of your function, and it transforms this into a, into a Fortran function, compiles and gives you a function in Python already. Right? So you don't have to do so much of that stuff. Okay? Uh, I think even SimPy has a, has a function called uh, auto wrap that does something like that. But uh, it's a bit tricky, right? So I tried it for a few minutes and couldn't get it to work, right? So I thought, okay, if I wouldn't get it to work in a few minutes, maybe I shouldn't be including this in the class, right? So, <laughs> yeah? Okay. Uh, but there's some, some, some way to go uh, in this direction, okay? Yeah? But I won't talk about this uh, further, okay? Because I think this is. Uh, yeah, it can be a bit more complicated in terms of uh, doing this for ourselves, okay? Uh, and finally, the, the, the thing that I really want to go into is parallelizing our code, okay? So, uh, so everyone has heard about uh, processors that have multiple cores, okay? Even these days, even your phone has many cores. It has, I don't know, four cores, eight cores, depends on, on the model, okay? Uh, so back in the, <laughs> what I told the before times, right? So like, <laughs> like something like 20 years ago, right? Computers didn't have multiple cores, right? So it was only a single, a single what we call a single CPU, okay? a single core processing unit, okay? And uh, of course, you still could run, like, well, I'm here, okay? In this, this is a, a Windows machine. I have uh, the browser running. I have this, uh, if I, I won't teach on to Dell here because I'm afraid that maybe, but it, usually there's a test manager that shows you several tests, right? You can run multiple programs at once, even with a single CPU, okay? You don't need multiple cores to run several programs at the same time uh, in codes, okay? Because what the computer does is it runs 
this, the browser, and then it runs the other program, and then it runs the other program. Switching between tests is very quickly, okay? So there are a few, a few tens of microseconds for this program, then a few ten seconds, ten seconds of microseconds for other, other, other program, and so on, and so on. And it keeps alternating between tests about there are different programs running uh, so quickly that you don't even realize that they are not really running exactly at the same time, right? But once you have multiple cores, okay, multiple cores, then you can have uh, more than one process running exactly at the same time. One runs in this R, the other runs in a different core, okay? Yeah, so this is, uh, uh, this is what it means to have multiple, uh, multiple cores, or right? multiple uh, CPUs, okay? So they are both able to process code independently, right? It is uh, really at the same time, okay? Not in the sense of alternating between processes. No, they are really running at the same time, okay? Yeah, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, for those that are not familiar at all, does that? Okay, okay, so, uh, so modern computers, right? So most of computers these days have usually something like four cores. Uh, if you build more powerful computers, they can have eight cores, 16 cores, and so on, right? So, uh, but these are already very powerful computers usually. Uh, and of course, if you have a, a cluster or something like in your university, they have these large clusters and so on, then you can have something like hundreds or maybe even thousands of cores, okay? This is not so uncommon these days, right? You don't need a, uh, like a billion budget to do that these days, okay? Uh, okay, so the idea then, okay, so how, uh, the idea is, okay, if I, if I take, I don't know, one hour to run this, the, the code that we write here, right, they run usually in a single core, right? Or, or maybe the computer can decide to switch cores okay, in the middle because it's just trying to, <laughs> to, to accommodate. But usually it runs in a sequential order, okay? I, I take this program from the beginning. Uh, I don't know, maybe I have some, some code here. So when you run this, it starts from the beginning and goes towards the end in the linear order, okay? In the linear order, right? It doesn't... Uh, it, 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 there's, there's no way in a program like this, just a written like this, to, to have it take a piece in one, it, it doesn't, it, it has no way to divide into multiple R's because it's a linear program, okay? It goes in the order that you wrote, line by line, okay? Yeah? So, uh, so in that sense, your program, the, the usual thing is to run in a single CPU, okay? In running a single car, okay? But then uh, the idea is, okay, if I have a, a problem that I can divide the, the, the task into, into multiple subtests, then I can make a better use of the computer, right? So if, if I have a test that takes one hour, right, and I can divide it into, I don't know, maybe four subtests, and each of them, each of them take 15 minutes, and I run them in four different cores, maybe I can run this whole thing in 15 minutes instead of one hour. Yeah, this would be really nice, right? Yeah, so I essentially divide the total running time by the number of hours, yeah? So that's, uh, that would be a, a really large speed up, okay? And then what we're going to see here is how to do that, right? And, uh, and parallel computing can be really tricky. There are some tricky situations. If your tests, so if your job, your tests, right, they are not completely independent, right? If I have a one, one test that depends on some other test that is being done in parallel in another, in another core and have to wait for that to finish, to get this answer, to go back here and finish this computation and then this is necessary for another part. If there, there are interdependence between different tests, right? Is it still possible to use parallel processing? Yes. But then you need communication among processes, okay? And this is uh, quite tricky, okay? This is quite tricky, and I don't want to go into that at all, right? So this would be a real parallel processing <laughs> course, okay? So this would take several classes and so on, and you would need to learn a lot of stuff, okay? Uh, how to do communication uh, between processes, yeah? I just wanted to ask if you have any um, recommendations on where we could uh, find classes like this for um, more advanced um, parallel computing? Uh, I think at, at least here at ICTP, they use it to have, uh, I think, 
there were at least two or three editions of a, of a course that is also offered in some other places that is uh, high processing computing, I think HPC. You remember that, Silas? So, so there are several, actually this is the one I, I, I heard about because it happened here, okay? <laughs> and I, I'm always around here. But then uh, it's not so hard to find uh, courses about this. Yeah, I think you can, uh, uh, if you Google around, you can probably find it. But then there are also courses that, uh, real courses like uh, with an instructor and so on that is not just uh, sets of YouTube lectures, okay? But uh, this is not, uh, programming courses are usually very abundant in the internet, yeah? So, <laughs> so uh, you can probably find something else on YouTube and so on, okay? Uh, but real uh, uh, person, in person courses, you have to, to keep looking, right? So uh, they yeah, probably you'll be able to find, but then I, I don't have one in mind right now, okay? Okay, so, yeah? Okay, so, uh, okay, so the, the type of problem that we're going to see here is only the kind of problem that in the literature on parallel processing is called embarrassingly parallel problems, okay? What are these? These are problems that are complete, where the, the tests are completely independent of each other, okay? So for instance, uh, the problems that we have seen, for instance, if I do, I'm going to do a bifurcation diagram, okay? I have to run it for this parameter and then this and then this one, the other one and so on and so on, right? So I have to run the code for many different sets of parameters and then at the end I take the results of each one and plot them together, okay? But each computation for each set of parameters is completely independent of the other parameters, right? Yeah? Well, yeah? Yes or no? So this is the kind of problem that, uh, this is a very common type of problem and this type of problem is pretty easy to, to use multiprocessing, okay? Okay, so, uh, so what we're going to see now is how to do that in Python, okay? Uh, uh, one thing that I, I want you to remember is that, okay, I chose to, to give this, this, this whole course in Python, okay? But many of the concepts that we're doing, we are studying here, uh, are not only uh, for Python, okay? So pretty much any processing, any computer language that you ever learn is going to have tools for parallel processing and many of the interfaces or many of the ways to do those are pretty similar, right? right? So you, you can also do exactly this kind of stuff also in R, in C, in any, in other, any other language, right? So, uh, so if you take this onset you can also apply it in other, uh, in other programming languages if you ever need to, right? So, so this is not really specific to Python, okay? So, okay, so let's go for the, for the gory details, right? For the gory programming details. Do you have questions so far? No? Okay, so let's just begin with a very, very simple, very simple example, okay? Uh, okay, so, so Python, there's, there's a, this library in Python called multiprocessing, okay? So this is a library, but this, this is a built-in library, okay? Built-in library means that you don't have to install anything. It comes with Python already, okay? Uh, I'm going to import it using MP, this, we're using this name here, this alias, okay? And then I will, I will have, I write a very uh, simple function that is just the square, the square of this number x, okay? But this goes too fast, okay? The problem with looking at time of computation is that usually things are so fast and so fast that <laughs> it's really hard to measure the time that, that, that stuff takes, okay? Because they're so fast, they happen in milliseconds, okay? That's really hard to compare times, okay? So what I'm going to do is, and instead of inst to simulate, I don't know, something that would take a long time, I put a slip, a slip here in the middle. What does a slip mean? It, it tells the computer to wait 0 0.2 seconds, okay? Just wait, do nothing. <laughs> Keep waiting for 0 0.2 seconds, okay? So this is just to simulate some code that would take a relatively long time to run, okay? Uh, 0 0.2 seconds is a very long time for computation, yeah? Okay? Okay. And then, okay, uh, what I'm going to do, right? So uh, here, I'm going to use a, a, 
I'm, I want to take a list, uh, I'll take the values from 0 to 8, and I'm going to take the square of each number, okay? But then I'm going to do that in a way that is slightly, like, how, how would you do that usually, right? So, so you either write this uh, as an array and, and apply this function to the array, or you write this as a list and do a for loop over the list, right? Yeah, so these are the, f the two ways to do that usually, right? So there's a first way that is nice for us to learn because it's usually the way to use uh, um, uh, parallel, uh, parallel, parallel plus processes, okay? So this is using map, okay? So what map does? Uh, for those familiar with R, right? Map does what the apply functions do, do right? So remember apply, L apply, V apply, and so on, right? What they do is they take a function and they take a list of values, right? So data is a list, okay? So data, maybe let's, uh, uh, let's uh, maybe do this step by step here. So I have this thing here. So if I print data, this is just a list, okay? Okay, and what I want to do is that I want to map uh, this into that, okay? So, oops. So when I do this, what, what, is, what is this, right? So uh, this means apply delayed square to each element of data. So it applies, data, it applies delayed square to zero, then to one, then to two, then to three, then to four, then to five, then to six, then to seven, and it returns a list with the results, okay? Yeah, does, uh, is it clear or not? And then it's, yeah, you see? And it returns a list with the squares, okay? Because the function here calculated the squares. Okay, yeah? Yes or no? Questions? So this is simple, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, so, uh, but then uh, this takes a bit longer, right? A bit, uh, takes a while because, uh, because inside the delayed square, I included the sleep command, okay? So, it, so for each time that it takes, for each time, for each number, it waits for 0.2 seconds, okay? Okay, so, uh, so I'm going to do this, this computation here. And, uh, and then there's this directive at the top of the cell. So this is a special, uh, this is not a uh, usual uh, Python, it's not, not a Python, it's a, a, a Jupyter Notebook directive that tells you to run this, this cell code here, and at the end, print the time that it took to run it, okay? So this is very useful for timing, okay? So I just put uh, uh, percent, percent time, and then when I run this, this stuff here, uh, at the end, it tells me, okay, this took uh, 1.6 seconds of user time, okay, of, uh, of wall time. Wall time is what you, what you, what you you'd use, measure with your own watch, okay? Of course, it also prints how much long it took internally, okay, of processing time. And since this is a very simple calculation, it, it actually took only a few milliseconds, okay? So, <laughs> yeah, so this is actual time of computation, but this is, the time it took for in your, in your own time, okay, in your, yeah? So this is usually the, the, the time you're interested in, okay? Okay, yeah? So all time. What other things wall time takes into account, like printing the screen or just Yeah, wall time is the time that it took to run all of this old. Yeah, from the beginning to the end, right? Okay. So if I had set, if I measured exactly the, so it, it, it does more or less like this. It, it, it says, it, it records the, the time before running the code, runs the code and records the time at the end and takes the difference, yeah? Okay, and uh, this is, is, is very precise, okay? So this is, uh, yeah. Okay, good. But now this is, uh, why did it take 1.6 seconds? here, right? Because there are eight numbers here, each one takes 0 0.2 seconds because of this slip here, so it takes 1.6, okay, yeah? And the time that it actually takes to make the computation is so small that it doesn't even add anything, right? Yeah? So far so good? Okay, so, uh, so now we want to do this uh, in parallel, okay, in parallel. 
So uh, we had MP imported, and the first thing is we have to learn how many cores we have available, right? And then now there's an end of a, a, a disappointing thing here, is that Colab only gives us two cores, okay? So this is, uh, if, you, if you run this on your own computer, you will have all of the cores of your computer available, okay? But on, on the Colab, it's very limited, okay? So in this sense, uh, if you want to do very large computation and so on, of course, a lab is not, <laughs> is not really your, <laughs> your best tool, okay? Yeah, I, th I think I, I have told this, I have told you this before, right? So it cannot run a, a program that takes one hour on Colab, okay? Because it will not run for one hour. It will stop in the middle and tell you that your use time, your computing time was exceeded and so on and so on, okay? So if you really need a large computation, you need to run it in your own computer, okay? Uh, yeah, how many of you have installed Python, Jupyter, and so on on your own computers? Can you raise your hands? Yeah, okay, so, yeah. Okay, uh, was that too hard or, or all of you already knew how to do it? No, it wasn't too hard. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so if you want to use this, actually you are, of course, we can use Colab for examples and for learning, but will not be very useful at Colab, actually, okay? This will be much more useful on your own computers, okay? Uh, okay, so how do we do now with more, if I want to use those two cores, right? So uh, we do the following, right? So we have the same thing as before. We, we define the data over here, and we also will have this uh, map of the function over the data, okay? But now, instead of just using the map, I, I create something that is called a pool, right? So there's this function pool here that creates a pool of, of workers, a, a processor, uh, uh, that, that each element of the pool is a processor, okay? It's a, uh, yeah? So uh, it detects, it, it, here it automatically detects the number of, of processes, okay? I can pass this. I have an example here that where I can I tell it to use two, okay? But it usually if you don't put any number here, it will use all of the available cores, okay? So if you have two, it will be two. If you have eight, it will be eight, okay? So if you have a lot of them, right? If you have eight or 16 and so on, sometimes it's useful, useful not to use all of them, right? It's useful to leave one or two out so that uh, other processes that your computer is running do not interfere with the, with the job you have, right? So if you have many of them, it's, it's useful not to use all of them. Maybe leave one or two. Uh, yeah, okay? The function tool, uh, what, what is the default number of processes that it creates? Uh, is, is the number of cores that you have available. Okay. Right, so if you have, in this age, I have two here, you see? But if you're on computer, you have eight, if you use eight. So right? so you, you use all of them, yeah. Well, with two and even four, maybe the default is, is nice because, well, it's just m not so many. But if, if you have eight or more cores, I would probably take the CPU count minus one or minus two, right? So, uh, yeah. Uh, and I go from two to four to eight because I don't, rem there are not many computers that have uh, uh, seats or, 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 or odd numbers of, of R's, right? So usually there are, much, there are powers of two, right? So, uh, okay. Uh, and then uh, this pool object here, inside it, it has a, ma a map method, okay? So this works exactly like map. The only difference now is that when it applies this function to this list, right? Instead of going one by one, it goes Two by two, it takes two and sends one for one processor, another for the other processor, and so on and so on, right? So uh, when you run this, right, what happens is that you take 0.8 seconds, okay? So it, it took half the time. Yeah? So nice, right? Yeah? Nice. Be why is that? Because well, there was this, this 0 0.2 seconds waiting here, but then one processor was waiting for 0 0.2 seconds. The other processor was also waiting for 0 0.2 seconds, and then they got 
uh, double the speed, OK? Yeah, so this is a nice illustration, yeah? Uh, questions, people, is, is this simple? Is this clear? Yeah? OK, so let's now, uh, so this is a toy problem, right? So let's now go for, uh, for something more interesting, OK? So, uh, OK. Uh, one detail here that I, we don't need to care so much about this, but uh, this pool here, once you create it, it keeps open, OK? So it creates these processes, and you keep them open, OK? If you want to close these processes, you know, this P dot close, OK? Uh, if you forget to do it, it usually doesn't matter so much, OK? Unless you want to create another pool and, uh, yeah, question. There's another here. Oh, okay. um, yesterday, I was trying to run a code um, multi-threading, but I had some trouble. I I, I read something about this this multiprocessing, but I couldn't fit this into my code, and I was seeing this pool thing now and like in in a large chunk of code I had a function in the middle but after that I had to save the results in different files so using pool could I like open the pool run the function close it and then save the files how yeah well uh, the way we're going to see this here the, the the word, we're, we're going to use map exactly because map takes a list and returns a list, okay? And then the returned list is already our results, okay? So we put our results inside the, the, the return values, the results, okay? So you don't need to save anything to the disk. Of course, it can also, if your output is very large, okay? You don't want to keep all of it in a list in the memory, okay? So you want to save it to the disk. And then you can say that each function, each, uh, which of the, the, the worker function, right, this delay is where here, instead of returning the value, could save you something to the disk, okay? This also works. Of course, uh, when that happens, you also have an extra work later, because in order to analyze results, you have to go through the file, save it in the disk, and go one by one, and see what is inside, and what to do with that, so this is, yeah? I don't know, th does that answer the question? Yeah? yeah? Okay. Uh, I didn't talk at all here about input output, right? How to save to the disk, how to read from this, okay? Uh, maybe we'll talk about this uh, in another class. Yes? Um, do, do we, can we know beforehand if our problem is embarrassingly parallel, parallel or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you should know, right? You should what, know just by knowing you? that one computation doesn't depend on the other. One what, sorry? One, one calculation, one, uh, for instance, the, the example that I'm going to give here, right? So, so wait just a moment and then if you still have that question, uh, we, we go back, okay? So let's try an example from real life here. My questions, people. For now, okay, so, okay, so let's see here. So I close at the pool, okay? Uh, but it, yeah, it doesn't matter so much, okay? Uh, okay. Uh, you, sometimes you can even keep it open and reuse the same pool, right? But then I just redone the job to, I don't know, open the pool again just so that we have a complete example in each part of the code, okay? So a practical example is, okay, now you remember last, uh, last class, right? So we did a lot of bifurcation diagrams and so on, yeah? Uh, where is it? Yeah, this, this one here, right? So you remem remember this, yeah? Right, so what, what, what we did here was, we looked at each carrying capacity, and then we, took, we changed the list of parameters to include that carrying capacity, run the code, run the simulation with OG int, took the minimum and the maximum, and add it to this list, okay? But actually, you see, for each value of k, I have to run OG int, and calculate the minimum and the maximum, okay? Uh, that to do that, it, it doesn't matter 
the other the results for the other values of k, right? Yeah, this is what I mean by independent. Okay, uh, yeah. In, the, the way I wrote this old here, I kind of introduced a dependency, but it's kind of artificial, right? Because I have this uh, append, right? So what I mean is a list that I go adding values one by one, right? But it's not because the, the work itself needed to be done in order, right? I just, had, I just did this because this is a for loop and then I go one by one to have the results in the same order that I have in the, in the KK uh, array, okay? But uh, it's not really that the result that I save here depends on the, result, on the previous results. It doesn't depend at all, okay? It would have done uh, from backwards, it would have done it's in any other order. It doesn't change the result, right? Yeah? So this is uh, what is an embarrassingly parallel problem. Yeah? The results for each value of our meter, each set of, of, of values, is completely independent and running in any order. You don't need to know the results for the other sets of our meters, OK? Yeah, so, so we are going to use this example now, right? So let's. Uh, run the same code as again. So this is again Rosenitz by MacArthur uh, with a long time here, this initial condition. And here I just copied that code, okay? Copied the code over here. So this is not, um, not parallel at all, okay? Uh, this is just the same for loop as before, okay? Uh, I just doing this, just, just check that this code is running over here, okay? But now, uh, what do we want to do? We want to rework uh, or we want to rewrite this in a way uh, that looks like what we have done up here, okay? So instead of having a for loop, I want to do it as a map, okay? I want to have, so my, uh, my different values of k will be the list of, of parameters, and I want to map to apply a function over this list of parameters uh, using map, okay? Yeah, so, so, so I, I have to change a for loop for a, uh, for a map function, okay? So let's do it there. So, uh, oops, over here, okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll set up a, a, a helper function, okay, that just receives the carrying capacity, that is the thing that is varying over the loop, okay? So for each value of k, what I'm going to do is actually what is here, okay, inside the loop, okay? I redefine the parameters. I calculate the solution, I take the minimum and maximum value for both consumer and resource, okay? Okay, so let's try this. So the helper function takes the parameters, change the values of k, calculate the solution, take, takes the minimum and takes the maximum. But you see here that it doesn't append to a list. There's no list here yet, okay? I just take the minimum and the maximum, okay? And what do I do, right? So minimum is the minimum over x0, so there's two values here actually. What I mean here is the minimum over the resources and the, and the minimum over consumers, okay? And y max here, also two values for the resources and for the consumers, okay? And then I return a list of those two values, okay? So now I have a list of two elements with two elements inside of each, okay? Good? Okay, and this will be the result, okay? And now, what I'm going to do is, and I have this list here, that is the range of values for k, and my results will be what? I will map uh, into, the li into this list of values the helper function, okay? And then it will calculate helper over each value of this range of values of k, okay? And I take the result here and convert it to an array to be easier to manipulate later, okay? So let's see how long does this take. Oops. Ah, okay, didn't run the, the previous one, yeah. So here it is, uh, and here it is, okay? So this takes a bit of time. Uh, okay, so three seconds, nice. 2.6 seconds. Okay, so now, uh, you see that now there's already a, a funny thing here is that here, uh, in the previous order with the loop, it was easy to have a list of minima and a list of maxima, okay, separated. But now I have, when I return, I return uh, the helper function here, 
it has to return everything inside a single object, okay? So it cannot really have two separated lists, you see? So I kind of have to combine all of them together in a single object, okay? So this already makes our, our results a bit more complicated. So what are the results here? What is this object results that I just outlated here? Okay, I have, uh, uh, yeah, I think maybe at this time, uh, it will be, yeah, let's do something like this, right? So, so may, let me calculate helper for k or to 10, for instance, or 15. Yeah, so just to see what it returns, okay? You see, it returns a list of two elements, and each element is an array that is two by two, okay? Uh, uh, two by one, yeah? So let me convert this to an array, right? So. Oops. So you see, this becomes a matrix, you see? So, uh, so these are the minimum and the maximum. The first column is minimum and maximum for the prey, for the resource, and the second column is the minimum and maximum values for the consumer, you see? But now, when I, when I do this thing here, when I map helper to this list, I will have what, I'll have this exact same four values, this two by two matrix, for each of the values of k, okay? So I have what, I have finally have a three-dimensional array, okay? So let's look at the results here. So the results, they look like this. They have, uh, I have 39 values of k over here, and for each of them, I have a two by two uh, an array two by two, okay? So the first column of this here uh, is for the prey, uh, the minimum and the maximum, you see? So this is minimum zero, zero 0.5, 0 0.5, and maximum also 0 0.5. And the second column here is the minimum and maximum for the predator, right? So here I just plotted the first line here, the first line is with k equal 2.5, okay? This is a region where predator goes extinct, remember? Yeah, the first point in the plot. So when predator goes at sync, the minimum and the maximum is around 10 to minus 16, okay? So this is pretty much zero, okay? Does that make sense? Yeah, so you see that uh, the calculation is the same, but you have to organize the results in a slightly different way. You cannot really separate the output into two different lists that you do appending. You have to take all of the results at once, okay? And then this will lead to a code that is organized in a, in a slightly different way, okay? Uh, okay, so now we want to plot it, okay? So what do we plot, okay? So we want to plot the minimum for the resource. What is the minimum for the resource, right? So I take all of the values of k, though, so the, the first index are the different values of k. The second index is the line here, so the line is minimum or maximum, and the third index, that is the column, means uh, resource or consumer, okay? So here I take the minimum, all the values of k, the minimum values for the resource. Here I take all the values, maximum values of the resource. Now I take minimum values of the consumer, maximum values of the consumer, okay? So now, instead of two lists, I have, uh, right, I have, instead of having y min and y max separated, I have them as an extra axis in our array. You see? Does that make sense or is it too confusing? Uh, then, and when I run this, I get, I should get exactly the same plot, hopefully. Yeah, so exactly the same plot, okay? So we run uh, pretty much the same code uh, but now, I, I should sure didn't parallelize anything, right? I just use it, instead of plot, instead of doing a for loop, I substituted a for loop uh, by a map, okay? A map over this helper function, okay? But this already has a structure that we need to do parallel computation, okay? So I, I changed this structure because with a map, now I can just exchange, I just need to substitute this map over here for the pool dot map, okay? So now the parallel version, okay? The parallel version will be what? I just have the same range of values for k. 
now I create a pool of values, and then I, when I told the map function, instead of telling map, I told p dot map, okay? And that's it. Yeah? Okay, so let's run this, okay? So, yeah, so it didn't take <laughs> to pretty much the same, <laughs> to pretty much the same time, right? So this is kind of disappointing, or not? What do you think? Yeah, so this is one thing about parallelizing, okay? So there's always, there's always some overhead, right? So what is overhead? It means that uh, it will not always be double the speed because uh, there's also time involved in setting up the two processes, in passing the arguments, receiving the results. So there is this, uh, uh, like, uh, there is time spent uh, organizing this stuff, okay? So it's pretty much like right, when you divide a task between two people, right? It's not double the time because they have to coordinate among themselves, you have to divide the tasks, you have to put the results together in the end and so on, right? So it's not exactly two times, okay? And the more processes that you have, uh, the larger, relatively speaking, this overhead is going to be, right? So usually, uh, uh, this is not worth, of course, you see, it's not worth at all it, did, it, it, it even took a bit longer to run with two processes here compared to with, with one for a process that takes only a couple of seconds, okay? So this is not worth at all. You won't go from, from a hit and wait three seconds to a hit and it takes only a second. It, it doesn't work like that, okay? This is really worth it for processes that take, I don't know, half an hour, one hour, and so on and so on, okay? It doesn't, uh, you shouldn't be worrying about this for processes that take only a few seconds, okay? You are not going to, to gain anything from that, okay? Yeah? Okay, so, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, I, I don't think I have ever parallelized anything that takes less than a one, one hour, okay? Because uh, just the time it takes for you to set up the code, it's easier to just wait, <laughs> yeah? Unless you're going to run this one hour program many, many times later, okay? But then, yeah. Okay, so we didn't win much here, okay? So let's try something even more complicated, okay? So uh, do we have questions uh, so far? Uh, yeah, uh, let me just, uh, I run this. Let me just plot it just to be sure that uh, the shape is the same, and the plot is really the same, just to be sure. Yeah, the plot is really the same, yeah? So the work was, it was done already, okay? Questions? Your question was answered already, yeah? Okay, can we move on? Okay, so now from a, a, a problem that is a bit more complicated uh, that we had before, right? So uh, at the end of the last class, we had uh, this thing here, right? The, the, the thing with two parameters. You remember that one? Yeah, like this. Uh, this, this plot here. When I try to explore a space with two parameters, okay? So, uh, so let's look at this problem now, okay? So this is the code that we had before, right? Once again, I'm repeating the code. I just copy and paste uh, from last class, okay? Just getting out the, putting everything together here. So I have the Hosen's mania, MacArthur uh, uh, equations here, right? So these are the same. You have this function to check if we had uh, 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 a consumer extinction, we have stable existence, or if we have cycles. You remember that as well? Yeah, so I'm not going to go into this again, right? So this is exactly copy and paste of less less. And finally, I have this function that takes the two parameters a and h from the Rosenfeld MacArthur model uh, changes the parameters, the set of parameters, run the simulation again, and takes the, the end, the final times here of the simulation, and checks in which regime it is, right? If it is consume one of the one of those three, okay? So it takes the two parameters and returns in which regime it is, right? Uh, and the code that we had last time, right? So uh, it worked like this. We, we set up a range of A's and a range of H's. I had this grid here of X and Y, right? So I had to have 
all the values of a along this this whole plane here, all the values of h along all this plane here, and this is what uh, mesh grid does, right? And then what did I do? I used uh, this function here for each of the values of a and h, okay? And to do this, I vectorize this function, okay? And uh, and then I you, with this vectorized function, I just run it for each values of x and y, okay? Now, you see, this code, uh, it's already a kind of a smart code. It's already optimized in a sense, okay? Because it's already using vectorized functions, okay? So this already saves quite a bit of time, okay? Uh, uh, here, uh, well, there's the plotting thing here. Uh, so this took 20 seconds only. Uh, I'll plot it here just to check that it's correct, okay? Here I have another version of this, right? Uh, where I, instead of having the vectorized version to run, I use uh, a for loop, okay? So I, I set up uh, a range of uh, uh, the values of z over here, right? In, with all zeros. And then I, feel, I, I do a for loop over the values of i and j, okay? Over the whole plane. And calculate for each value of z, for z i j, I, I solve, classify the function. I solve and then classify the, the results, okay? So this, this is usually slower, okay? But then, now I run this anyway, right? Just to give us some comparison. But then, uh, uh, there's a cautionary note here that is a bit tricky to compare times in collab, right? Because uh, uh, you don't really know if the conditions are exactly the same in collab, okay? Because uh, there are two things that can happen here, okay? So one is that Google servers can, you know, compute a lot of stuff together and then maybe you are using it at a, a, a busier time, you don't know, you don't have much control over that, right? Another thing that you have to be careful uh, is that some of these calculations, the calculations that you're doing here are pretty much the same that you're doing up, up here, right? So. Uh, and, uh, and Python is a bit smart about this, right? So sometimes it can, uh, it can remember a bit of the results, okay? <laughs> right, so if you want a fair comparison, you have to maybe uh, reset everything, run all this stuff until here, but then don't run this, run directly this if you want to compare the times, okay? So, so this time is here, I'm doing it for fun, right? To see how it's done. But it's not really f a very good measure of the real time you would take if you, if you have used this method, okay? Yeah? Okay, so with this note here, we, had got it, we have got essentially the same time, right? For the for loop and the vectorized, the vectorized code, okay? Pretty much the same, yeah? But now let's look at the par parallel version, okay? Uh, Okay, so the problem now is the following. Uh, before, right, we had, what, what we had before? We had a map, okay, a map that took uh, a function that received a single parameter and applied it to each element of this list, okay? But now our function doesn't receive a single parameter. It receives two parameters, A and H, right? So how do you pass how do you use a map that applies to two parameters? Okay, so this is, this is an issue right now, okay? So the first thing is, okay, there is a function called uh, star map, okay? There is a function called star map that is very similar to, uh, for the pool, right? It's very similar to map, right? So I'm going to use it down here in a moment, okay? The only f difference between star map and map is that uh, it can pass multiple arguments, okay? So, uh, so if your list of arguments has several elements, it can pass it a list of, uh, of arguments and it will pass this list of arguments in each other function, okay? Let's see an example in a moment, okay? So, uh, but then uh, our, our arguments, okay? They are this X and Y grid, okay? This X and Y grid. 
they are not organized in a list, they're organized in a grid, okay? Yeah, so what do I have to do? I have to, to message these structures here, those numbers here, uh, or these two arrays, in such a way that they become, instead of having uh, two grids of values, I want them to become uh, a single list of pairs of values. Yeah? Does that make sense? So, so what we are going, we are going to do? So let's uh, we are going to use something called zip. Okay, uh, we want a list of pairs. So what what does zip do? Right. So, so zip does what a zipper does. Okay. Or what a what a zipper do? Okay. So it's a very appropriately named function. Uh, so you think in terms of you have two lists. Okay. And uh, what zip does? It takes this two list. It takes this this two list and it zips them together, okay? It takes each ele of element of each of one, pretty much like what, what you should do with a zipper, okay? It's, it puts them together, okay? So if I have this list here, uh, this values from zero to 10, two by two, and one to nine here, uh, two by two, okay? So I have the two lists, and then I call uh, zip on the two lists, okay? Uh, here it goes. So the first list is 0, 2, 4, 6, 8. The second one is 1, 2, 5, 7, 9. OK? Uh, if I call zip, uh, the zip itself it doesn't already turn this into a list, OK? It turns it into a zip object. But then you can, you can see it by converting it back to a list, OK? Uh, so what does this list here look like? It takes is a, li a new list. Where each element is a pair of values, right? So zero with one, two with three, four with five, six with seven, eight with nine. You see? Yes. Will zip always convert uh, to tuples? To yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. So with this now, okay. What can we do? We have this 2D arrays, okay? So let me print here x, for instance. x was the values of a, okay, in our, in our problem. Okay, so, so from 0.01 to 1.5, right? Uh, and you see that it's constant over the columns, but it changes along the lines, okay? Okay, so this now, this is a shape, this has a shape, this is a 2D array with 18 lines and 16 columns, okay? Uh, we want this to be uh, a single list, okay? Not a uh, not a two D array, okay? So there's this function called flatten, okay? That essentially just flattens, uh, flattens it out, right? So it converts a two D array or um, any dimensional array into a single dimensional array, okay? So it, it just reshapes it to be uh, a single dimensional array. So if I call x dot flatten. Now I'll have uh, the same values as before, you see? So I go from 0, 0, 001 to 1.51, and then again, and then again, and then again, you see? Uh, so here it is. It goes from 0 0.01 to 1.51, and then again, you see? And then again, and then again over here, and so on. So these, are, these have exactly the same values as before, but not, no longer as a 2D array, but as a single dimension array that now, what is the shape of this? It doesn't have two values anymore. It has only a single value that is 288. That is, uh, I hope it is 18 times 16, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay? So is it clear what flatting does, right? And what if you wanted then to go back to the original structure, okay? To get this flattened array and go back to the original X array, right? To go back, I just have to take the, the flattened one and reshape it, okay? If I reshape it back to the original shape, uh, I get uh, exactly the same array as before, you see? Now it's up back again to 18 by 16, okay? And I, I get back the, exactly the same array as before, yes? Is that something that is used in image classification? Uh, Flattening and then? I, I'm not sure. Really. Um, I don't think so, actually. 
Yeah, I, I don't think so, no. Uh, there are some other functions that people use that is smoothing, right? But then it's not, it is loto, it's not like uh, inverting everything to a single array. Right, so I, I, I don't think so, no. Okay, more questions? Okay, so. Uh, okay, so far so good. So uh, what we have to do now is, okay, we will flatten the x array, right, to have a list of values. And we will also flatten the y array to also have a single list of values. And then I'm going to zip both x and y together to have a list of values, a list of pairs of values, okay? And this is what we're going to pass to our map function, yeah? So this is a, maybe a big, a big step already, but uh, what we have to do now is we create a pool, we call solve classify, with star map, why star map? Because I need, need it to, have to receive a list, of, a list of pairs of values, and for each pair of value pass, to solve it, classify pass a pair of values, not a single value, okay? Because map always pass a single value, star map in pass multiple values, okay? And what are, so solve it, classify is the function that I'm going to apply to the pairs of values inside zip, okay? So zip takes the x flattened, the y flattened, and makes a list of pairs of values, one for x, for, so each pair is x, y, x, y, x, y, and so on, right? So, yeah. And, uh, and, and then it will do this in parallel. Then what do I do with this now? The result here will not be the same as z was before, right? Because now I have only a single list of values, okay? So I have a list. Instead of having a two, uh, uh, an 18 by 16 array, I will have a, a list with 288 values in a single in a single row, right? In a single one-dimensional array. So, in order to plot it, I have to go back to this two-dimensional array, right? So, to go back to the dim two-dimensional array, I will I will pick up this result here, convert it to an array because it was a list, and then reshape it with the same value, with, with the same same shape I had before. Okay, and then and that's it, right? And that's it. So, I, if I run this now. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be <laughs> faster or slower than before, right? But then, uh, yeah, because it's just two cores, and uh, yeah, and uh, I'm creating the pool inside here. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it took more or less the same, <laughs> same amount of time. But as I told you, uh, for small times, this is not worth it. Also. The, the, the time to create a pool and close the pool takes some time also, right? So uh, uh, here it, it actually took the same time, okay? And then we take the result just on, should to check that z here is exactly what it should be, right? Just to look at the plot. Here it is, it's exactly the same plot as before, okay? So the computation was done correctly, but now in parallel instead of uh, in, a single, in a single core, okay? Uh, okay, people, so this is, this is it, right? So it's already, oh yeah, it's year 15, so we have some time, yeah? Questions? Yes? Um, can we use parallel computer computing with SimPy? Uh, well, you, you can in terms of if you have a problem that is really, parallelizable, right? You have to do something like that. Most SimPy problems, if you just want to, I don't know, solve a system of equations, is you usually run in a single CPU, right? I don't know if that's the question, but uh, yeah. Uh, I have never used a SimPy in parallel, I think, because usually the, the problem is not embarrassingly parallel, because usually you just do, want to do this computation, and there's no way to, to, to yeah. And SimPy itself, I think, is not built to, to, to take advantage of parallel computing. Yeah. More questions? Okay, so uh, I, I didn't prepare exercises for today. I thought it wasn't, there wasn't enough time for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
But then, uh, yeah, if you don't have questions, uh, there's something I want to talk about if we have a bit of time. Do, do, you want, do, you have, do you want to use this time for something else, right? Questions from other exercises or, yes. No, again, I was mostly wondering about how I could use parallel computing in the case of classifications with like random Sorry, forest. Sorry, can you repeat? The case of, the case of what? <laughs> Classifications with run, uh, random forest classifiers. Ah, okay. Maybe I was thinking about neural. I forgot the rest of the. Ah, name. you're going deep into all the machine learning algorithms yeah. and so on, but right? But then so, these, yeah. I I I feel that they use a lot of like results from the last. Yeah. So. From one into the other and then like yeah. usually in machine learning it's a bit it's a bit trickier because usually you have a very large data set okay because that's why you're using machine learning right if you're using machine learning for a small data set there's something wrong right <laughs> yeah so usually you have a very large data, data set uh, and you have to to process it to you know machine learn right you want to just over some some classification or you have to stretch some features, you want to just do something with machine learning on that large data set, okay? But then the results depend on the whole data set, okay? So this is usually not an embarrassingly parallel problem, okay? But it's usually, it is usually the case that it is possible to use parallel computing because you can do a lot of stuff more or less independently and integrate the results later, but then, uh, you cannot use this, okay? You cannot just use uh, uh, this kind of thing. But you, many of the many of the tools, many of the libraries that uh, compute like random forest or classifications and so on, many of them uh, are, are already uh, written with multiple cores in mind, right? So they can already take advantage of multiple cores in your computer, right? So this is the good news. You don't have to. Uh, for most problems around, you don't have to do anything for yourself. You just run the code and it already uses as many s cores as it is, there is available, okay? So in a sense, yeah, it is much more complicated, but usually we are lucky and someone already solved that problem for you, yeah? <laughs> okay, because that, that's not an easy problem at all, okay? That's a complicated problem, but uh, the functions usually already do it by themselves, yeah? I don't have much experience with that, so if someone else has more comments about this, wants to add something, uh, yeah, because machine learning is really not my, not my, my piece of cake, no. No? Okay, so, yeah? Uh, more questions? Okay, so uh, let, let's take uh, uh, this final moment here to, to talk a little bit more about the environment of Google Colab, okay? Because, uh, because uh, someone uh, had, uh, yeah, uh, about saving files to the disk, okay? So uh, what, what is the disk, okay? And what is this Google Colab here, okay? So, uh, so uh, let's do something uh, funny here. So, uh, one, one thing that is uh, interesting to, to remember is that when you, when you have Python, okay, you have a specific version of Python, okay? So there's Python, well, I don't know if any of you remember the long time ago, Python 2, and then, then came Python 3, and now we already have Python 3.1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, right? So, uh, so Google Colab, is a specific environment, okay? Uh, that may be different from the one you have installed in your computer, okay? So there are, they may be, there may be a, a, a few changes, okay? a few differences. So let me open a new notebook here. Uh, just not to pollute the other one, okay? So, so what is, uh, how can we just over a bit more about the environment of the, of the Google Lab, okay? So one simple way to do this is 
Uh, you have C. This is a library of the of the of uh, from Python that, that is a built-in, and you have this sys dot version that should be the Python version. Okay, so if you run this here, right? Uh, I hope my memory is serving me right. Okay, <laughs> maybe I got it wrong, but I hope not. Okay, so you see this is. Python version 3.8.10, okay, compiled on, compiled on November 2022. So this is a pretty, uh, pretty recent Python version, okay. If for people that have uh, Python installed on your computers, you can do this to check which version of Python do you have, okay. I think you probably have different versions. Uh, yeah, or no? Someone has a different version of Python over there. Yes or no? Uh, but then, besides uh, the Python version, you can have different versions for each of the libraries. Okay? So, for instance, uh, if I import NumPy, let me do this. Import NumPy, uh, import uh, matplotlib, uh, import SimPy. Okay? Each of them is doing, oops, is doing to have uh, their own versions, okay? So NumPy, what is NumPy version? This is usually uh, uh, the library and then this thing here, right? So NumPy, np.version, uh, let me do this for the other ones, yeah, so. So for SimPy, is going to be sp.version and matplotlib. Oh, I tried matplotlib without, yeah. So, yeah. so it, each of those have some versions, okay? And what are those, right? So I have here numpy 121.6, numplotplotlib 3.2.2, and simpy 1.7.1, okay? Uh, why am I telling you this, right? Because last night <laughs> I was working on uh, on this lesson here, and I I noticed that do the documentation of SimPy that you see on the on SimPy's website, okay? If you go for SimPy documentation, okay, uh, you have SimPy 1.11, okay, and the next version will be 1.12, okay, and then I thought, okay, but in Colab I am I'm still at 1.7. Right? When was 1.7 launched? Well, it was over two years ago, right? So for SimPy terms, this is a very ancient version, okay? So there are some libraries. So this is something uh, about uh, code and about uh, software, especially open source software, uh, that, is, uh, that is useful to keep in mind, okay? So NumPy uh, is something that is quite old, right? So it's something that is very well established, okay? So Although there are newer versions of, of NumPy coming out like every year, right? Uh, the main interfaces and the main functions that you're going to use, they are probably not going to change at all, okay? <laughs> because they are very, very well established. The same thing for Matplotlib, okay? Uh, so uh, I, I have been using this stuff since, I don't know, 2007, 2008. And uh, uh, they, they, the stuff that I use day to day has never changed in NumPy. And even in Matplotlib, uh, I think some of the de default line styles and colors have changed. But the functions that I use and so on haven't changed at all. The only thing that changed over all this time, I think, was 3G plotting, right? 3G plotting changed quite a bit, OK? But other than that, everything else was exactly the same as it was uh, 15 years ago, okay? So these are very, very stable libraries, okay? This is not the case for SimPy, okay? SimPy, 15 years ago, barely existed, okay? So uh, it's a, a kind of newer library, okay? Uh, that is still going uh, through a faster development, okay? So there are several tools, several uh, uh, things that are available in SimPy from end of last year compared to SimPy from two years ago, okay? So what do you do here if you, I want to use, I want to use the latest SimPy, right? I don't want to use this old SimPy outdated, okay? So how do you do this in your computer? Oh, well, just install the, the, the right SimPy version, okay? The last SimPy. 
version, okay? But then what do you do with collab, okay? What if I want the la latest version of SymPy? What if I want to use some library that is not available on collab? Have you thought about this? What if it's not in collab? I cannot use it at all, right? So no, there are some ways to do this, right? So the thing is, in collab, okay, in, you, you have something uh, that if you run code that starts with an exclamation point, it doesn't run in Python. It runs in the underlying shell uh, that is in the computer itself, right? So not in the Python command line, okay? Uh, I'm not sure if this is <laughs> uh, if this is very clear what it means, right? But then uh, maybe maybe let, let let's let's do some uh, some comparison here. So you are very familiar with Air Studio, right? Yeah, yes or no? Everyone's familiar with Air Studio by now, yeah. So let's let's open Air Studio over here, right? So where it is, Air Studio? Uh, let's just. Uh, I hope it is installed here, right? So, yeah. So you have here our studio, okay? Uh, and here, what do you see? Uh, uh, you see the list of files. You see the list of of variables, right? So if I have, I don't know, let's see, oh, one here, I have the values of the variables. But then this is the air shell, okay? The air shell. Right, so this uh, this runs commands in R, okay? But if I click here in terminal, right? Uh, yeah, sure, why not? Uh, what do I have here? Is a shell that is in the computer, not in the not in inside R, okay? So here I can uh, check list of values. I can change where I am. I can, you know, I can install programs for the shell, I can do a lot of stuff on the computer itself, not inside Python, okay, or, or here, not inside R, okay, so this is, uh, uh, yeah, do, do you understand the difference, or is that too, too, I don't know, confusing, yeah, the difference between the, the, the R, common line, the R shell, and the computer shell, okay, so in collab, if I want to run some program uh, in the, in the real environment, in the computer, in the, in the lab itself, not inside Python, okay? I just run a command with an exclamation before, right? So these are usually uh, uh, actually a Linux computer, so you have to know some, some, something about Linux, okay? But then the nice thing here is that you can use pip, that is a, a, a command line to install programs, uh, Python programs, okay? And I can tell it to install SymPy, okay? When I run this, this stuff here, what, what does it tell me, okay? So let's see, right? So this is, so this doesn't look anymore as a, as a Python result, you see? It looks like it, it, it's a shell, okay? So it's looking through these libraries here, and it tells me that, okay, SymPy is already satisfied, it's already installed, okay? The version 171, okay? Well, this is not what I wanted. I wanted it to install an upgrade, okay? In install an upgrade, I do this, okay? Install an upgrade to the latest version, okay? And now it is downloading here, the latest version, and now uh, it's uninstalling the, the other version. And uh, it's hopefully, let's hope it is, <laughs> it works, right? So it, it downloaded 111, you see? That is the latest one, you see? The latest one. Uh, and installed, okay? And now it, it's alerting me that I have to use it, I have to reset the runtime, right? So I have to restart runtime, okay? And when I run this old again, you see, SyncPy was 171. And now, and now it is 111.1. So now I can use the latest version of SyncPy. Nice, yeah? But, but be careful, right? Because if I open a new notebook, okay? If I open a new notebook and run exactly this old again, what do I get? Any guesses? The older one or the newer one? Yeah. 
that, that the older one, right? So whenever I, I have a notebook that I want to use the newer one, I have to, ins to include uh, this installation here. And just see, it's better to include it before importing SimPy for the first time. Otherwise, I have to restart the runtime and so on, right? So usually, I install libraries at the very beginning of the old before I import anything else, OK? So this is something that is uh, good to know, OK? Because sometimes you may get, especially for SimPy that is still actively developed, you may get slightly different results if you run in Colab versus your own computer, OK? Good, so now, OK, I think it's, it's OK for today, right? So there's more stuff to tell about Colab's environment, but uh, we can use another time for, for that, OK? Thank you. <laughs>